This is Support is Sexy, episode 504, with literary agent and publicist Dawn Michelle Hardy, CEO and founder of Dream Relations PR. Welcome to Support is Sexy. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I bring you inspiring women entrepreneurs who share their wins and lessons to help you take your business to the next level. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm so happy to have you here. It just would not be the same without you. And listen, if you are a book author, if you're someone who's interested in being an author, if you're a writer, if you're interested in the book publishing industry, if you want to know more about the industry from an agent perspective, from a publicist perspective, certainly from a writer perspective, don't sleep. Do not play yourself. Get pen and piece of paper. You know, I say this once in a while for certain episodes. This is one of them. If you're driving, you're definitely going to want to go back and listen to this later. If book publishing, the book industry, or any of that is of interest to you. Because today we are doing a special episode, a masterclass on the podcast with Dawn Michelle Hardy. And Dawn is called The Literary Lobbyist. For a reason. She has been in the publishing industry for more than a decade and she has been a publicist and an agent. So she has what we say in this episode two seats at the table. And in this episode, she's giving you a seat at the table so you can really understand the process of what it takes to write a great proposal, how to get your proposal to an agent, how to get that agent to be excited about bringing it to an editor, but then what the process is like after it gets to an editor and goes through the publishing process, why you might get signed for a deal, why you might not, why you don't necessarily want the big advance, what it means to earn out the advance, What does social media really have to do with your book deal? We talk about that. You know, I talk about that sometimes, right? But what does it really have to do with your book deal? How does it all tie together? So much great information in this episode. I haven't heard anyone share about the book publishing industry on the traditional book publishing side, I should say, as Dawn does in this episode. So you're definitely, again, going to want to not only listen, but you'll probably want to take note. I took note. I had a conversation with Dawn even before this interview for an hour or more. Actually, I think it was more than an hour. We were supposed to talk for a little bit. I had so many questions and she's so generous and kind with her information, giving an inside scoop on what it takes to get your book published, the process, as I said, really giving you a seat at the table from her point of view and her experience. So I've kept you from it long enough. Are you ready? Got pen and paper? All right, here we go with Dawn Michelle Hardy. So Dawn, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm so excited to chat with you. Uh, Thank you, Elaine. I'm happy to be here with you. Absolutely. Everybody, Dawn is called the literary lobbyist because she knows all the goods about the publishing industry. So we're going to dive into all that today with a masterclass on book publishing. But Dawn, first, I want to ask you our first question. When did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? Oh, my gosh. Um, Well, I think I, I, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur at the age of six. Um, I didn't know what the business was going to be, but I would play with my dad's junk mail and those would be my, my pseudo business documents. Mm -hmm. And I would make him sign his signature with my crayons. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I always said, Oh, I want to be an entrepreneur. Um, I just didn't know what the industry was going to be. Like I went to school for, uh, for fashion. So I really never knew what the entrepreneurship was going to be, but I always wanted to be one simply because I wanted to have control over my own career and destiny. Did you see that somewhere in your life growing up? Like, who did you see that was a business owner? Or you just like the idea of, I used to love the idea of having papers too, probably still yeah, too much um, today, but having you know official what? papers kind of thing. No, that's the thing. Like, so growing up for me, I, I didn't necessarily see anyone that was an entrepreneur, but my dad being, uh, being a single dad, he would always bring me copies of Essence Magazine. So I feel like mm-hmm. growing up, Essence Magazine kind of co-parented with my dad. So as I got older and just reading, there was always women that were profiled in essence. 
and in Jet and in Ebony. And I would always say, oh, I want to be profiled in one of those magazines. So for me, I associated being profiled in one of those magazines as women who own their own businesses. So either you were in there for fashion and beauty or it was because you're a woman that was doing something powerful. And I associated that with, oh, okay, if I want to be in those magazines, I have to own my own business and help a lot of people and be a powerful woman in that entity. So that, that's kind of like where the mindset came from. But I, there was no one in my family um, at the time that had graduated college or even like had their own business at the time. So it was really just what I saw on the pages of Ebony and Essence that made me say, in order for me to get there, I'm going to have to have my own business. It's you such know, an I know example that's not necessarily of, the case. But, no, you know, but it's such an at, example. At 16, that's what you believe. Yeah. Right, right. And it's such an example of seeing a reflection of yourself or seeing yourself in those. Yeah. In those that's why it's so important today to have people represented in all different mediums because you never Absolutely. know how that's going to inspire somebody. Yeah. And then when I was in college at 19, I wound up getting my first internship at Essence Magazine in the fashion and beauty department. There you go. I was going to ask yeah. about fashion and beauty. So did you pursue that some after college and, and then make the shift to publishing, which we'll talk about? Yeah. yeah. I, I, um, when I graduated FIT, I went into visual merchandising for Banana Republic. My degree in, at FIT was in fashion buying and merchandising. So I basically oversaw um, all of like the retail displays and, and visuals for Banana Republic's Fifth Avenue stores. And then... Um, you know, just wanting to transition over from that after a while, like those late nights were driving me crazy and I wanted to get into something else. And then a colleague uh, suggested that I assist an author who was, who was on the radio basically saying that she was moving to New York and she was looking for an assistant. Oh, so tell us about that story. Oh my gosh. Um, so I, my first job in publishing, I was an assistant to Terry Woods. She's a uh, author of True to the Game, which actually was recently adapted into a film on Netflix. So I worked with Terry for two years. The only thing I didn't do was write the books. I came up with cover ideas, wrote cover copy, did proofreading, um, helped with distribution and, and the marketing and publicity, which was the part that I really, really loved. But it was, it was a great experience because she was self-made. So again, right. when you talk about that entrepreneurship, even at that time, I still, you know, again, one day I'll be an entrepreneur, but one day when, I don't know. But I was working with a woman who I knew didn't go to college, but she wrote this book. The book was optioned by Cash Money. They gave her a check, and that's how she was able to launch her business and move to New York. So seeing her road to entrepreneurship gave me something to say, oh, wow. Oh, okay, so it's, it's not like you have to go to college or have a whole bunch of bells and whistles to become an entrepreneur. You could pick something that you're really good at or that you like to do and launch from there. And for Terry, it was her book. So then I, I kept that in my mind when I was ready to launch my own business. And Terry is one of the early, because what year was that? 2000? Oh my God, uh, 2002, 2004. Yeah, I was going to say early 2000. Yeah, because she's one of the, the first, at least one of the first that I knew about, self-published, self-made authors who really yeah. showed how, yeah. how it could be done, especially in the, I guess, I don't know if they called that urban fiction or whatever they yeah, were absolutely, at the time, absolutely. but she definitely showed that this is possible. Yeah, urban, urban fiction. Um, self-made, you know, she came, came from Philly. And mm -hmm. like I said before, it was uh, Donald Goins back in the 70s. And then Sister Soldier came with the coldest winter ever. Yeah. And then after that was Terry was true to the game. And that basically opened up this whole genre for African-American urban writers to tell their stories. And a lot of people fed their families and changed their lives by just telling their experience living in urban communities. Mm -hmm. yeah. now, was Sister Soldier self-published? No, right? no. Um, yeah. she, she had a deal. I think, I think yeah, Simon I Schuster was one of her publishers. Yeah, I, I think, think so. Simon Schuster, yep. So what was it like then after you had that experience of working with Terry for two years or not necessarily what was it like? At what point did you decide that you wanted to start your own company, Dream Relations? Well, I worked with Terry for two years. So because urban fiction was so big during that time, when we would go out to like events and stuff, you know, you would meet other urban fiction authors, uh, mm -hmm. ones that were already had, had self-published their book, but then ones who were in the process of it. And they would always kind of come up to me on the side of like, oh my goodness, I see the work you're doing with Terry. I would love to work with you. Um, but working with Terry, like I was her employee. So I'm like, you know what? That, that's a conflict of, of interest. I can't work with you in urban fiction while I'm working with Terry. So um, after two years, I decided to, the part that I loved about working with Terry the most was the PR and marketing. So after two years of working with her, I basically sent out this mass email to book vendors, authors, bookstore managers, uh, book clubs, and other authors, letting them know that um, 
that I was going to be starting Dream Relations PR and Literary Consulting, and that this would now allow me the opportunity to consult with other urban fiction self-published authors and also offer publicity services. And honestly, like people started emailing me right off the gate. I was going to say, I'm sure people yeah. were like, yes! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, right, right off the gate, people started, I mean, editors, like people in the media, everybody just says, oh, don't you know what? Contact this person. I know they're working on a book. Contact this person. People, guys in the barbershop was like, oh, my man is coming out of jail and he wants to write a book. Everybody just started reaching out. Um, so, you know, I'm really blessed in that regard because I can honestly say 13 years later that nine out of 10 authors that I've worked with have come from referrals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now you've been in the business more than a decade, like you said, 13 years. What yeah. would you say has been um, some of the some of the greatest or maybe either the greatest work you've done or the most proud of, of some of the people that you've worked with, either a specific example or, Mm -hmm. or just um, overall, as far as helping people get their stories out there and also um, have people be able to see it. Cause that's the thing. You write a book, you put it out there, but you really help people be seen. Right. Well, so there's, there's three things, projects that come to mind. I'll start with one of my first clients. And I mean, when I say one of my first, I think, Miasha might have been like my third client. So um, she, I read her manuscript when I was still like working with Terry. And uh, when I started my company, I reached out to her just, you know, hey, how's it going? Have everything go with your book? She had just told me that she had gotten um, a two book deal, six figures with Simon & Schuster. And that her editor had told her, you know, the, I know the type of career you want to have. You should reach out and find your own publicist. And then I literally called her the next day. Um, So we worked together on like four of her six books, which meant that we were working together over multiple years. And I'm so proud of that project and working with Miasha and her debut was Secret Society because she was a couple of years. Yeah, she was a couple of years out of college, really told me, listen, you know what? I want to write for a career. I eventually want to go into TV and film. And we built a relationship. So a lot of the press, like some of the first press I got for her was she was on the Wendy Williams show and she did an interview with BET. Back then the media was was a lot more stable than it is now. But that was a really big deal um, for a first time author to get those type of placements. And we grew over the years and all the press that we had gotten, um, it eventually wound up where a writer for Elle magazine reached out and basically said that they saw the work that she was doing. They read some of the articles and, and press and that they wanted to feature her in Elle magazine. In Elaine, it wound up being four and a half pages <gasps> in print and online. The story is called The uh, Pulp Princess. You could actually find the story online. What's it called? Yeah. The Pulp? P-U-L-P? Pulp, mm-hmm, pulp oh. Princess. Mm-hmm. Oh. And Miasha is spelled M-I-A-S-H-A. M-I-A, as I was going to ask that. Perfect. Yeah. Everyone, of course, I'll have links to all this, but I know you're writing it down. All right. Yeah. The Pope so, Princess in yeah. Elm. Mm-hmm. So four and a half pages in print. Gwen Stefani was, was on the cover that year. And I think this was maybe about like 2009. So I'm proud of that project. One, because it helped to catapult Miyasha's career. And, you know, she went on to write numerous books, but also the fact that eyes were on what we were doing. And that's how someone from L looked at it and reached out. And honestly, urban fiction authors, Elle magazine was not necessarily the media outlet that was interested in that. But they love Miyasha's story. And again, four and a half pages in print. That's huge. That's, that's, that's over a million that's, dollars in advertising. Right. That's a, fe- <laughs> like, that's a feature. Yeah. Yeah, man. Four and a half page. And for it to run online. Mm-hmm. You know, so mm-hmm. that in itself is amazing where you get both spots. Um, so I was really proud of that. Another project I'm proud of as an agent is um, a book called Not a Game, The Incredible Rise and Unthinkable Fall of Allen Iverson. Mm-hmm. And this is written by Kent Babb. He's a writer for the uh, sports writer for the Washington Post. And what I love about that project is it goes to show how agents and editors work together. I was having lunch with an editor at Simon & Schuster, and he and I both love sports. And we were like, you know what, let's come up with a list of three sports figures that we want a book on, whether we do the book with them or we work with a sports writer. But we we know that a book on these particular sports figures would do well. Floyd Mayweather was on the list, Kobe Bryant and Allen Iverson. Kobe Bryant, there was a writer who had just did a deal with him. Um, We were, me and the editor were meeting in the 4040 Club and Floyd Mayweather walked in while we were having this conversation. And I was like, Oh my God. Okay. Let's see Mm. if I can make that happen. Mm -hmm. And then the third was Allen Iverson. Someone had shared three weeks later, 
an article that Kent wrote about Allen Iverson. And the article basically was shared over 20,000 times. And it concluded with Allen Iverson saying, you want all this money from me and I don't even have money for us. I don't even have $5 for a sandwich. And as a big NBA fan and a specifically a fan of Allen Iverson, I was like, wait, he doesn't have $5 for a sandwich. What happened to all his money? Right. So he didn't have a, a farewell tour the way Kobe Bryant did. He kind of, you know, moved around from team to team and then went over states and kind of faded to black. So I reached out to Kent and said, I read your article, you know, in the Washington Post. Um, I'm a huge fan of Allen Iverson. He was saying he was as well. We started talking about basketball. And I said, you know, have you ever thought about writing a book? And he was like, most people at the Washington Post eventually do write a book. Mm -hmm. I just don't have an idea. And I said, I have an idea for you. I said, you seem to have your pulse on what's happening with Allen Iverson today. And his fans really want to know what happened. What um, happened? I was in know, Hampton when he was in high school. At Hampton, oh in Hampton. It was like he was the God. Yeah, so it was, man. It's crazy to hear that. Yeah. So I basically proposed, uh, you know, to Kent that he write a biography on Allen Iverson. And again, it's because he was on our list that the editor and I had spoke about. So mm -hmm. when he was like, oh my God, are you serious? And I said, yeah, I, would you be willing to write a book about Alan Iverson? And I said, he said, yes, I, I signed him to a serendipity literary agency. And then I went back to the editor and said, you're not going to believe it. The guy who wrote the article about Alan Iverson, I just signed him and he's agreed to write a biography on him. So it was an exclusive submission. And that project went directly to that editor at, um, at Simon and Schuster. He, he gave a, he offered a deal that was more than pleasing to, to the author. And our book was one of the best sports books of uh, 2015. Wow. And it was shortlisted for a Penn Literary Award as well. And that was the author. And that was Kent's first book. That's amazing. Yeah, and it's so, amazing too how it all kind of comes together. So for everyone listening, all the writers or authors or people interested in writing, you never know how it's going to come together. It could yeah, be from an article that you did. It could be yeah. from, you know, just keep doing. That's an example or a reason I should say to keep doing your work and putting it out yes. there, right? Yes, people because people think, oh, I got to just do a book or I have to write the proposal. You never know where someone's going to see your work. Exactly. And the thing is, writers write. So writers whatever write. that medium, whatever that medium is that you're writing in, writers write. So just mm -hmm. continue to do that. If you don't have an idea, just continue to do what you do. And someone who has an idea and sees your talent will say, you know what, this is a person that can execute the idea I have. Kent was someone who could execute the idea that me and the editor had for this biography on Alan Iverson. And, mm -hmm. and he didn't even know he had an idea, right? Not at all. But he had he, the work. It, 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 was, it was just him doing his day job. Mm -hmm. Doing his day job, yeah. Great examples. Excellent. And now, so we should mention also, everyone, as you can hear, Dawn has her PR and literary company, but then she's also an agent. So you also yes. are an agent with Serendipity. So you're on all sides. Yes. yes. All I, sides. Have two, I have two seats at the table. Uh, two seats oh, at yeah, the I'm, I'm the publicist who helps promote finished work, and I'm the agent who helps sell new ideas. That's the perfect segue into our masterclass Yay. we're going to do today. I'm so excited. Yay. So this isn't a seat at the table. It's two seats at the table in yes. the publishing industry, everyone. So again, if you're listening, unless you're only, if you're driving, don't stop or do anything crazy and try to write all this down. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm trying to tell you, I had a conversation with Dawn. It was supposed to be, I don't know, maybe a few minutes. We ended up talking for an hour and something. She is a wealth of information, so I'm so grateful that you're here to share with us. So we're going to do this episode with asking Dawn some questions, some masterclass questions about book publishing, and she's going to share her wisdom with us. Absolutely. So Happy the, to. Thank you. So the first question, Dawn, starting from the beginning of the process, mm -hmm. what do most writers miss when it comes to their book proposal? Like, are there common mistakes that we make? Well, one of the uh, common mistakes that I find that most people uh, authors missing their proposal is that they don't do enough research in the competitive and comparable title section. So in that section, you're supposed to basically be comparing your book idea to books that are already out in the marketplace to say, because these books did well in the marketplace, my book should sit on a shelf next to it and would do well because, and make a, and make a comparison. And a lot of times what authors do is they pick popular books because they believe, you know, because they're trying to make a case. Oh, Eat, Pray, Love, that memoir did well, so mine will do well. But a lot of times those books, they are books that are anomalies. Like you shouldn't compare your book to Twilight or Harry Potter or Eat, Pray, Love or uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. Because those books, 
there's really an anomaly behind them. In that section, you're really supposed to use books uh, no older than three years old. So a lot of those books that people want to compare to came out years and years ago. If you're writing a proposal today, none of those books should be in your comp titles because they're too old. So you want to keep it within three years and simply because the industry changes so much. A book that did well in 2010, there were certain bookstores that were around, there were certain media outlets that were around, um, certain distributors that were around that are no longer around in 2018. So the comparison, you want to keep it as tight as possible. And again, just compare your books to books that have come out within the last three years. And I always tell authors, well, I don't know, you know, most authors are going to say they don't know what books sold well. All you got to do is go to Amazon and just use the rankings. Use the rankings as an example. If a book is in the top 100 and is three years old, that's a really good indicator that the book sold a lot of units. So just use those Amazon rankings. And obviously, you stick with books that are in the top 100, top 500, and again, no older than three years old. That will give us as agents an idea on how well the books did. But we're also able to look that information up. So for you as the author, just use the Amazon rankings to give you an idea of books that did well. But don't compare your book to those, don't compare your book to a Sheryl Sandberg Lean In. She's the CEO of Facebook. Her relationships and network is probably going to be a lot bigger than yours. So to make that comparison, you're not really, you're doing yourself a disservice because you're not going to sell as many books as Sarah Sandberg because you don't have that network in place. So I think that section is just, it's so important. And I think authors kind of just rush through it, but money decisions are made from that section. So I just think authors should give a little bit more time to that section. Right. And also, it's interesting. I, I just noticed that you mentioned comparing yourself to these other books, uh, mm-hmm. not the, the uh, like you said, not the, you know, phenomenons, but um, even in comparing to other books, it's like this, these books did well. This is why I think mine would do well. Whereas I've always thought in that section, you're supposed to say this, these are um, books that are similar. And this is why my book is different. Do we add that as well? Or is it more so is it better to see why similar books did well? and how our book is in that category. So yeah, so, so you do both. So like both. If, 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 if in the course of like five sentences or so, you give a one-liner about the book, just in case whoever's reading a proposal, they may not be familiar with that book. So mm-hmm. you give a description about the book. And then from there, you compare how your book is, is similar. Because you want to basically prove that this book did well, and the readers who read that book will now be interested in my book. Because while they got this bit of nugget, I'm adding some additional information from a mom's standpoint or from an African-American standpoint. So you want to say it's similar in this vein because you want to show that the people who read that book would be potential buyers for your book. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have to make the comparison how you guys can share the same shelf in the bookstore, but then your book is different because it's fresh and new. So again, you want to get the readers from those existing books in your section, but you also want to make a case that I'm not going to be redundant with the books that are on the shelf. I want to be on the shelf with them and my readers can definitely translate and we can swap readership, but my book is still fresh. So you have to make a case for your book being fresh, but you also have to make a case that the readership of those books in your competitive section would also be interested in your book. Okay, makes sense. Now, what are three things that you personally look for as an agent and a publicist um, Mm -hmm. that would make you say yes when you read a proposal? Oh, my goodness. Well, because I've been doing PR for 13 years, I definitely look for um, for author platform. And, And with that author platform, what is the network and relationships that the author is coming to the table with? that will help them sell and, and promote their book. You know, so do they have byline articles? You know, have they done television interviews, podcast interviews? Do they have some type of Facebook group or, you know, Instagram, a large Instagram following? And when I say large, I'm looking like over 20,000. Um, Instagram following that can translate into your promotional community. So like this can be your circle of influence. Do they have relationships? with notable figures that would agree to endorse their book. I look for, so when I go to a proposal, you know, I read what the idea is about. I'm like, okay, this is great. And then I skip straight through to the platform, see if I like that, and then I go back and and continue to read the rest of the proposal. So for me, I definitely look at platform. 
Um, most agents want to work on a book that they like the idea. I personally, I only work on books that I would buy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of editors uh, will say the same, um, you know, which, which can be unfair to a lot of talent out there because it's like, if you're writing a book on science and I don't like science, more than likely I wouldn't be an agent that would take that book on simply because I'm not interested in this topic enough to be married to it for the next 18 months. So personally, I like to take on titles um, that I like, you know, music, sports, pop culture, relationship, memoir, books. Of, I love books of essays, um, humor. So I, I look, basically look at topics as well. So the author platform and is it a topic I like? And then obviously, I don't have an editorial background. Like I said earlier, my background is in fashion. So your writing has to be strong because that's not an area where I can help improve you. So I, I need my writers. Like Kent, when he wrote um, Not a Game, I had him put a little synopsis together of just what his idea for the book was. And I shared it with someone and they basically said, oh my God, he is an amazing writer. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have, there was no correction on, on my end. Even his editor said, wow, you know what? I hardly really had any, any feedback. I didn't have to do a lot of markups in his book. His writing is that good. So That's for amazing. me as an agent, yeah, so for me as an agent, there are agents that can take you at a B because they have that editorial background and they can work with you on the writing and the development. I'm not able to do that. Like that's not my skill set. So therefore I look for writers. You have to be like a B plus or above because I can't help you with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very interesting. And that's another thing too, for everyone to, to take in when you're looking for the agent that you want to work with, you know, that it has to be a good marriage between you and the agent. Like you said, yes. you, you know, okay, this isn't a person I'm going to be able to work with because that part I can't assist with, or, or they, the writer needs to go get that support elsewhere and then, mm -hmm. come to me. but so everyone doesn't think, oh, this agent just doesn't want to work with me. It's about the right. right partnership, right? And like you said, that you're going to be with that person for the next at least 18 months or more. Yeah. 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 Or hopefully longer if it all works out. Right. Exactly. So, you know, just knowing that you're going to have to constantly read over a manuscript or read over a proposal, you want it to be on a topic that you enjoy because then you won't mind reading it. Because again, whatever the book is, whether it's a manuscript and it's, you know, YA or whether it's a proposal on relationships. The agent is going to read through that proposal in that manuscript, like probably like five or six times, but before the book actually comes to market. So now, you want, a, so personally, you want it to be something you enjoy. Right. Now, in a proposal, do you think, uh, I don't know if there's a set, I've seen different models for um, mm -hmm. organization wise, right? For what should go yeah. first, what should go second. Some people say they want to see the chapters first to see your writing. Other people, and I've heard this most more recently in how I did my proposal, like you said, the platform, like the marketing was higher up than everything else. Yeah. People, a lot of um, um, publishers look at that first now. So do yeah. you have a suggestion when you work with your writers of what the order of the proposal should be? Yeah. For, um, for me, I think that, again, so we're talking about nonfiction. Mm -hmm. I think the proposal should open up with um, the marketing analysis, you know, mm -hmm. like the overview. What is, what is this book about and why is this book needed in the marketplace? you know, two years from now, because that's basically when the book is going to come out. So a lot of times mm. a person's idea can be too present day. Like, oh, you know, I want to write about Trump and, and this is what I want the book to be about. Okay, well, he's already almost two years in and it's going to take another two years for your book to come out. So this might not be so hot two years from now, only unless he's reelected. You know what I mean? So a lot of times you got to think about what the idea is and the marketing analysis from the jump this is what my book is about, and this is why I believe this book needs to come to market. But you're not just giving your opinion. You're following it up with facts and statistics to support that whatever your topic is, readers need this. My readership needs this book, and here's why. So I want to know that from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Because the thing with agents, while I may like certain topics, I'm not an expert on those topics. So each author is coming to the table and, and I should be enlightened after I read your proposal. So you should share information in such a way that I'm like, oh, wow, I had no idea that this many millennial millennials didn't want to be parents or blah, blah. Like you have to be the expert on, on that particular topic. And I'm going to get all of that and just how well you put together the marketing analysis, which shows you know what your book is about, 
but you also are looking at it from a bigger picture. A lot of times authors, they get so caught up in their idea, but they never step out and step off on a ladder and look down and say, okay, well, let me see what the market looks like and where does my book fit in in all of this? Because that's the case that you really have to make. Mm-hmm. You know, your idea is just your idea, but where does it fit in the big picture of publishing for the demographic that you want to get this book to? Right. So I like to see that first. Um, and then a person can go into who they are as who they are as a writer, you know, their author bio, and then go into publicity and platform, you know, and then continue on with the competitive analysis as far as the different books. In that section, you want to also include at least four to five titles. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, chapter outline from there. And then there's things like, you know, the spec, a smaller description of the book and things like that. But for, for the most part, it's the marketing analysis that I want to see first, then who you are as the writer. Because now when you get to your bio, after I'm impressed by the marketing analysis, I'm like, wow, Elaine has really done her research and she definitely has made a strong case for the marketplace in, in need of her book. And then next, I want to see your bio to see if you are indeed the right person to write this book. Because you might have a great idea and then look at your platform and be like, oh my God, this is a great idea, but Elaine doesn't really have the platform to, to, to lead this book. Maybe she should consider working with a psychologist. You know, because maybe you want to talk about childhood trauma or something like that. But the narrative is only from your experience. You can't write a prescriptive nonfiction book on childhood trauma Mm, if you're mm -hmm. only coming from your personal experience and there's the prescription that you're giving, you're not really licensed to give it. So I think there's validity if you partner up with a doctor or something like that. And I have an example. Um, I worked with an author who her son was gay and she knew that by the time he was 13 because she read something in his notebook. He would not reveal it to her until the age of 30. And they had a close relationship. So for her, it was like, me and my son are so close. How could he go all of these years without ever coming to me? He even so much as had a girl, had a, took a girl to the prom. But the whole while the mother was like, but I know he's gay. Like, mm-hmm. why is he going through this? Um, so her book that she wanted to write was basically how children can come out to their parents and, and, how, and what parents should do when their children come out. But again, now she's just a mother who had an experience. So she partnered with a therapist who basically served as a counselor to um, the LGBT children and their families. So he was a counselor for those who had come out and their, and their family unit. So the two of them partnered together and did the book. So now she's sharing her experience, but the, doc, the therapist has given his prescriptive take on how to navigate that when your child does come out to you. She wouldn't, have been able to, she, wouldn't have, she wouldn't have been able to do the book on her own because it would have just been a mom talking about her personal emotional experience with her son. So that really only applies to you. You know, you can't really give prescriptive as far as, especially a sensitive topic like this. Mm-hmm. She needed someone who could come and say, as a family therapist, this is what you guys would have to do as a network to keep your family together. So again, you could have a great idea, but you might, your bio is going to let me know, do you have the credentials to write this? So in that author's bio, she included that she would be working with the therapist and his bio was included as well. Smart. Now, did that book come out yet? Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. What's the name of it? It is called, oh my goodness, I have it in my library. I'm going to get that for you too, because that's a wonderful book. Okay. So you'll tell us that one. You can tell Mm -hmm. us it later, just in case people are interested in reading it. That sounds powerful. Um, okay, so tell us now, what do publishers really care about when deciding to work with an author? You've given some insight from um, the agent's perspective, but how are these decisions really made? Let's start with social media, num- social media numbers. How much does that Got matter? It. So the reason why social media numbers matter, like people always say, is there a specific number? It's not like you have, have to have 35,000 or mm-hmm. 57,000. 57, um, it's really about an algorithm that says one to 3% of your social media following will buy your book. So at that point in time, if you only have 2000 followers, one to 3% is going to be 20 to 60 books. (laughs) You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Not a lot. So it's really 
if you look at that algorithm of we believe one to three percent will follow you from social media and meet you at the bookstore to buy your book then that you need a higher number only because only one to three percent are going to buy your book for me um it also depends on what the person does for a living you know at the agency we uh, represented a, a gentleman who worked for nasa so his social media numbers we're not, <laughs> you know, right. that much, wasn't his you, you and I, yeah, you and I definitely have more followers than him, but he worked for NASA and he was doing a book on suspended animation. So his biography gave him the validity. We could always help him with the social media, but someone from NASA is not on Instagram, mm -hmm. you know, so it, so it doesn't work for them. So it really depends on the book that you're writing. You know, if that particular topic is a topic that can go viral on, on social media. And if that's the case, then you know that in order for that to happen, you're gonna have to come to the table with numbers that, that make sense for that project. The guy from NASA, his social media numbers were irrelevant to the conversation. But if somebody wants to do a book on relationship or social justice or activism, where you wanna get a community stirred up, yeah, then your social media numbers are gonna matter. But again, we look and say one to 3% would actually buy your book. But obviously, if a person has, I don't know, an upwards of 15, 20,000, I mean, I personally am, am always impressed by that. But I have multiple clients who have 30 to 50,000 followers. I have friends who have 60 and 100,000 followers. So it, it really depends on what you're doing um, and what your book is going to be about. And is your book a topic that you need to engage social media heavily? And if you know that you do, then you need to work on getting those numbers up. Now, like get those numbers up now before your book comes out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that, it's going to come up in conversation. Right. You know, it, it won't necessarily be a deal breaker, but if all things are considered equal as far as they both want to write on the same topic, they both have great platforms and, and byline articles. Okay, well, what's the topic? All right, well, you know what? Let's see. If Let our social media uh, manager weigh in. Well, Elaine has a killer platform on, on Instagram with like 200,000 followers and Dawn only has 2,000. That's going to be the tiebreaker mm -hmm. because that your one share and your one post could get them a thousand books sold, whereas mine may only get them 10 to 50. Right. Again, social so media it does come to up. Yeah. For everybody oh, it comes yeah, up in it, every... Yeah conversation every day yes. it, but it's the reality of where we are right now <laughs> and, and here's the thing though but it's also because it's an inexpensive way to promote so right. for publishers it's a business for the authors you know you don't want to spend a whole bunch of money um promoting your book so everyone knows that it's a free way to promote so again the numbers matter in that regard because everyone wants the book to be a success but we don't want to spend a million dollars to do it and your social media people, followers, connections, I like to say, are people who have already signed up to say, I like what you're doing or I want to see more of what you're doing, right? right. It's not the cold sell kind of thing. No, 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 no. So right. it, it doesn't make sense to get one of those where you buy the fake followers and all that. Don't, right. don't waste your time. But, he, but here's something else. Okay, so Elaine has 20,000 followers and Dawn only has 2,000. However, of the 2,000 people that are following Dawn, Shonda Rhimes is one of those people. Beyonce is one of those people. I'm, I'm, I'm putting up big names here. Oprah right. is one of those people. <laughs> Oprah I is say those. that too. Yeah. Look at who is following. Yeah, Oprah that. is following me. Uh, right. Serena Williams is following me. And guess what? So now in my proposal, yes, I only have a humble 2,000. However, here's my circle of influence. These six women mm -hmm. are really notable and they're following me. So then I'm going to put Serena's social media, how many people she has on Instagram, how many people Beyonce has on Instagram, Oprah, and then collectively now, oh, we got way more than the lane. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing. I only have 2,000 following me, but six of those women are like the most powerful black women in the world. So, and, and they would have agreed to support my book with something as simple as an Instagram post. So now I've, I've out, you know, I've outmatched your 20,000 by like leaps and bounds. Mm -hmm. Right. And now that and the social media part, so it's up to me to put that in my proposal. Where I fall short, I have to look at my relationships and see if they can make up the gap. And in that particular example, those that are following me that are influential would make up the gap. So now my two thousand 
becomes over 200 million. Right. That's such a great example. Thank you so much for sharing that. That just blessed somebody's proposal right there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because here's the thing. You, you know, you may have the popular bloggers and the radio show hosts. And mm-hmm. a lot of people know people. But when they look, they're like, oh, but my numbers are humble. Okay, well, think about the genuine relationships that you have. Right. Again, social media is just a matter of you sending, you know, lovey is your friend. And, and you send her a copy of your galley and she tweets about it. Right. You know, she posted up on IG one time. That that's filling that's filling in the gap, and then basically, so we call it circle of influence. Mm-hmm. So where you're where you lack, who is in your circle of influence that can make up the difference that would make a publisher say, "Oh, Dawn's numbers are low, but wait a minute, look at her circle of influence." Oh gosh, you know, and you want to make sure it's people that you really have relationships with. And if I was right. doing a book, none of those ladies are following me, and I wouldn't put them. You know, but I could put someone like you. I could put someone like Lovey. So you have to be realistic in, in who you who you have relationships with. Don't imp- try to impress the editor with just writing anything in your proposal, because the only reason they're impressed by that is because they really believe that this is going to help them sell books. Mm-hmm. So if you don't have those relationships. Don't put it down. Right. Because now you're basically you're overselling. You're saying, oh, I'm going to do all of this. And then when it falls short it'll come back when you want a new, when you want another book deal. Right. And that's the oh, thing you have to yeah. deliver on these, what you say, yes. of course you yes. can't make anyone do anything, but you, like you said, you want to have authentic relationships. And I yes. will tell everyone in my proposal, cause I'm not a, I mean, I'm on social media obviously, but I'm not a huge numbers person and I'm not on it all the time. And just yeah. think about it, you know, maybe I would have, if I knew it would come up in this way, but I have relationships with a lot of people from even before there was social media, you know, so working in in essence and in publishing for a long time and knowing people when we were all back struggling and assistance and that kind of thing. So as you said, thinking about your authentic, not just, oh, this person is following me, authentic Mm -hmm. relationships with people and saying, this is my circle of influence, people I have true relationships with, et cetera. Cause so that could, I really do think that's going to help a lot of people think, Oh, I could think about this in a different way and not yes. just say, Oh, I don't have the numbers so I can't do a book or a proposal. Right. Or yeah. yeah. You, you, you got to figure out by any means necessary. And it's like what you don't have somebody else that you're connected to does. Right. You know, and, and if it's, again, if it's an authentic relationship, why would, why wouldn't your friend post about your new book? Right. You know, now talk about, um, when we think about publishers considering whether they're going to sign you or not, mm-hmm. how much, um, how does it work with the P&L? So the P&L okay. is a part of the process, which is something right. authors just don't even think about. Right. So, okay. So for the authors and writers out there listening, a P&L is a profit and loss statement. So the advance that you get, there is some, there is a money person at the table and they're basically running the numbers to see how much can we sell this book for? Um, again, they get that information from what you put in the competitive and comparable titles as well. But how much can we sell this book for? Um, and based on how much we can sell it for retail-wise, how many copies do we think we can sell? And there's an algorithm that goes into place to come up with what the author's advance is going, is going to be. Um, and a lot goes into that. They are looking at the type of paper that it's going to be, how much it's going to cost to ship this book, you know, is it going to be hardcover or paperback? A lot goes into considering that. So when you get your advance, it's really basically the publisher saying, this is how much we want to offer where we don't feel if it doesn't do well, we won't lose a lot of money. We can afford to lose $15,000. And then obviously, if we, the book does 50000 then, you know, champagne for everybody. But mm-hmm. we can afford to put this book out for $15,000. And then that's how you as the author get that get that advance. So a lot of times people are like, oh, you know, I want a big advance. Well, okay, what's your definition of big? You know, you want $150,000 as, as a debut author with a medium sized platform. Now it may be big to you, but to people in publishing who look at this stuff every day, we define it as medium. Now 150,000, you're not going to get another check until you earn out. So whatever your advance is, you're going to get that one series of payments to total up that one advance. And then you may never see another check again if you don't earn out. So sometimes I tell authors, I'm like, you don't want a lot of money. You want to, you want to earn out and you want to get good royalties so that you can build a reputation. Now, if you just want to write one book and then move on to something else, 
then listen, get as much money as you can because we're not coming back this way ever again. But if this is a place that you want to stay and build your brand in, then, you know, get, get enough that, that you're happy and that you could treat yourself to something wonderful and that your agent is happy with what their portion is going to be. But you also know that you can sell out and, and be ready to come back to the table to negotiate even more for the next go round. But tell I always tell what, people, um, yeah. earn out. Tell everyone what earn out means. So earn out, basically, if your advance is $15,000, that's the advance the publisher gave. It's very similar to the music industry. Mm -hmm. That advance is recoupable. So they're not giving you $15,000 and saying, thank you for doing business with us. They're like, we're loaning you $15,000 because we believe that we can make that $15,000 back when you sell your book. So you don't get another check until I, as a publisher, have gotten my $15,000 back. You know, right. and that may take that may take years for some people. So let me get an example. Like Hillary Clinton, she I think one of her last book deals was uh, was a seven figure deal. That payment is spread out over years. You know, so you get first payment when you sign the contract, the second payment when you deliver the manuscript, a third payment when the book comes out in hardcover, mm -hmm. another payment uh, six months to a year later when the book comes out in paperback. At that point in time, you may not get any more until you've sold 250,000 or 400,000 copies sold. Because again, the publisher is not trying to give away a million dollars and not ever get it back. So at a certain point, you'll get maybe half of the money over the course of the production process. And then in the contract, they would have basically escalators that says, okay, she gets that initial round of payments but then she's not going to get any more money unless the book gets to 500,000. So the next 250,000 will only come if this book has sold 500,000 copies. So then if it doesn't meet that benchmark, they don't necessarily have to give her that 250,000. So it's reported that she's getting a seven figure deal, but if she ever gets all the money, it really depends on how well the book sells. Which is so important for people to know because we see these in, all in the paper or people talking about it, which is, hey, great. Like you said, if this is depending on what the author's goal is and the agent's mm -hmm. goal, of course, you know, mm -hmm. get that money, get the bag, secure the bag. Yeah. <laughs> but if you but if you're thinking long term, you want to think about, you know, is it more important to get the, the quote unquote big advance? And as Dawn just explained so perfectly, it's not just uh, you get this money for free. They're giving it away, basically. There's a process to it, how you get it over a certain amount of time that you get the money after you sell a certain amount of books or get money uh, on top of that, I should say, after you sell a certain amount of books. So there's a lot more to it. We all think going into it, I got to get the big advance. Right. And then here's the thing. So if you, if you don't earn out, that would be a reason. A lot of times, most authors, most contracts have um, a right of first refusal, which means you're going to get a one book deal. Mm -hmm. And then you have to go back to that same editor when you're ready to do the second book. And if that editor isn't interested, then they can pass and your agent can shop it somewhere else. But if they want it, then the process starts all over again and they'll offer you um, a new advance. If you don't, if you get a large advance and you don't earn out and they like the second idea, they'll take the second idea, but you'll get way less. Or they'll basically say, you know what? Yeah, but this is a cool idea. But you know what? I'm 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 already in the hole, you know, and and, and working with you, so I'm going to pass on this one. Right. So, so taking the yeah yeah. So so if you don't earn out, sometimes you know you could find yourself homeless again as as an author in the fact that oh my god, okay, I had an agent and a publisher, and now I'm on my second book and nobody wants it. Mm -hmm. They don't want it because you didn't earn out. So now your agent can now go and shop that book somewhere else. But rest assured, the conversation is going to come up. Oh, well, if she had a deal with HarperCollins, why didn't HarperCollins want this book? Oh, well, you know, she didn't earn out. and So it's going to come up. So again, you may get a deal with someone else. But again, they're more than likely going to tread lightly on the type of advance that they've given you because they don't want to go into the hole the way HarperCollins did for your first book. So, mm -hmm. so again, all of that comes into play. So yeah, you want to get as much money as possible. But let the money equal your platform. You want to know that you can sell the majority of, of the books that your publisher is going to put out. Mm -hmm. So and you're really going to have to hustle. <laughs> tell us, exactly. Tell us about the, um, also the retail assessment that also goes into consideration from publishers. Oh, the retail assessment. Okay, mm -hmm. so when it comes to 
when you go in Barnes and Nobles, people always see books on tables like, oh, you know, the latest summer reads or you'll see books in the window. Um, all of that is done through co-op advertising. So a lot of times authors are like, oh, well, you know, well, I, I live in Atlanta and, and I want my book to be in the window. Somebody has to pay for that. And, mm -hmm. and it's the publisher. And all of that goes into the marketing plan for your book. So again, if the publisher believes that you have a big book that people are really going to run out and buy, or they have the budget and they really want to push and make your book the big book, um, then they'll put that money in there. But a lot of times, like I said, if they don't believe that your book is going to be the big book of the, of the season, they're not going to spend additional monies um, to get you that co-op advertising space in, in retail stores. So anyone listening, when you get a chance and you go, next time you go to Barnes & Nobles, trust me, all the books that you see displayed in the window, someone had to pay for that. So the mm -hmm. books aren't there just because, oh, this is a pretty cover, let's put this one up. No, that's, they're, they're renting that space for the season. And that's why a lot of times you'll always see the same books by the same authors, the Dan Browns, the Brene Browns of the world. Like you'll see those type of books all the time because those authors make the publishers a lot of money. Therefore, their marketing budget is, is so much more. And that's why they get those, that retail space. And that's something that the publishers think about, too, when they're considering your proposal, right? How it'll do, how it could potentially do at retail or even asking the uh, bookstores how they think it will do. Yeah, because um, there's a salesperson on, on the team. So mm -hmm. when an editor is basically saying, that, oh, I like Elaine's proposal. OK, you know what? Let me bring this to my team. Um, there's going to be a publicist that's going to weigh in on Elaine's platform. There's going to be a salesperson that's going to look at the comparable title section and say, oh, OK, you know what? The account, we have an account with Target, we have an account with Walmart, and they do really, really good with these type of leadership books. Um, yeah, I can definitely sell a lot of Elaine's books to, to our largest accounts. Now, if the salesperson was like, listen, we have been bombing with these type of books at our largest accounts. They're just not buying as much as they used to. That would be a reason that an editor would have to come back and be like, you know what, as much as we love this idea, our, our sales force doesn't believe that our largest retail accounts are, are going to buy this book. And that's something that happened when Borders closed down. When Borders went out of business, they were buying more than 30% of all African-American titles. Oh, especially I didn't the, know that. Yes, especially on the fiction side. Early in the interview, I had mentioned that uh, the author, Miyasha, that I worked with, she had received a two-book, six-figure deal. That was back in 2004, 2005. So Borders was around. And Borders, again, they supported African-American authors. They always, they had a section dedicated to, to urban fiction. So they were buying 30 to 40%. Mm -hmm. So when Borders closed, who's buying that 30 to 40%? And if there's nobody there for the salesperson to sell that 30 to 40%, now the advances have to come down. So now I can't give six figures because 40% of that we're not going to sell those. We don't have the business anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, you have to always put titles that are only three years old. That's why the salesperson has to weigh in on the success based on what he or she is selling on the retail side of the business. Because again, if the large accounts aren't interested, then how is the publisher going to make money? So when borders went out of business, a lot of African-American authors, um, they either didn't get new deals or the advances uh, got smaller because, mm -hmm. again, 30 to 40 percent, you know, if you do 10,000, 10,000 books and one store is going to order 4,000 of those books and then that store goes away, you either now print only 5,000, which means you have to give a smaller advance because you're working with less. Right. So a salesperson sits at the table and, and they chime in to say, this is what we can do on the retail end with, with this, with this author's particular book. And like I said, you need that because it's a business. So when it's, it's all business. said and done, if the salesperson can't sell your book, <laughs> then, then why are we doing this? Right. So what are we doing? That's right. <laughs> you know, yeah. 
So everyone, as you can hear, Dawn is giving us a seat at the table with her two seats that are already there. Yes. And giving us a true masterclass. Now, Dawn, I hope you have some more time because I have more questions. Yes, I'm already an hour. I do. Okay, good. I just mm-hmm. want to, I would like to be conscious of everyone's time. It's already been an hour and I'm, I'm so into this. So hopefully, well, I'm sure everyone else is too. Now, this sort of segues, as you mentioned, about, you know, this is a business and we're trying to make money here on all sides. So let's talk a little bit more about why the writers should not take the rejection personally. I admit, oh, I have done this. I'm a writer. <laughs> I'm sensitive about my shit. You know, <laughs> like, what yeah. do you mean you don't love yeah. this? What are you saying? But as you said, it's more, it's a business and it goes beyond, as you, the seat at the table, it goes beyond the editor. It's not just right. the editor there. Right. So writing for the writer is art. You know, it's, it's, it's a purpose. It's, it's a, a bucket list item. It's something that they've always wanted to do. It's, it's some mm-hmm. research that they have to get out there. But to people in publishing, it's a business, honestly. And, and the best outcomes are when your love for the art and, and my need to handle the business when they perfectly can synergize together and, and, and make something wonderful happen. But at the end of the day, if you have a really good idea and your agent loves it and she's shopping it and there's editors that come on board, again, that editor has to pivot to their team and say, I would like to present, you know, at an editorial meeting. I have an idea. This is a book that I want to present on, you know, parents having conversations when their children come out to them. You need to get multiple people at the table to be on board. So your salesperson has to say yes. You know what? We've been seeing an influx in these type of books. Our largest accounts have been asking for more books on parenting and the LGBT community and how to navigate this new space. I'm on board. We need more. The publicist has to say, oh, my God, this platform is amazing. We definitely can break this book out on a national level. Those two, and then the marketing person can say, oh, you know what, there's great organizations that we can do tie-ins and we can share databases and do mailers, so I'm on board as well. If multiple people at the table are not on board, then it doesn't really matter how much your editor loves the book. The team is basically saying that as a team, we can't do well with the business of this book. And then that would be a reason that an editor would have to come back and tell your agent, Dawn, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to pass on, on this book because our team doesn't think we can break this book out nationally. So they didn't say your platform wasn't large enough. And even if they did say that, that's not a personal attack on you. That's just basically saying the facts. Your platform needs to be larger. That's not personal. They're not saying they don't like you as a writer. They're not saying they don't like your writing. They're saying that we're in the business to sell a lot of books on a national scale, and we don't believe we can do it with this particular project, with this particular author. So all that means is, okay, you pivot to someone else and and you keep it moving until you find someone that can. But it's not a personal attack on your talent. It's just basically saying the model that that particular publisher has in place, you don't fit the model for the type of business that they're looking to do. So it's never, I always tell authors, it's never personal. And while I know most of our conversation is around nonfiction, that does apply with, with fiction as well. Um, and, you know, fiction, it is a little bit more relative to people's personal taste. You go to a movie, you think it's Oscar worthy. I go to a movie and I want my money back. Right. We're, we're, we're both right. Mm-hmm. We're both right for, for how, what we got from it. But again, if you get your editor on board and the editor does like your novel, she still is going to have to have that conversation with the marketing, the PR, and the salesperson. No matter how much she loves the story, if they don't see a way to break this out nationally, especially with the salesperson, then it's, it's not going to happen. Because at the end of the day, they come together to make money, and, and, and it is a business. So I always tell authors, don't, don't take it personal. It's not anybody saying that you're not talented enough. It's just saying that it just doesn't work for the business model that we have in place at this particular publisher, at mm-hmm. this particular imprint. You know, so your agent will tell you, listen, don't worry about a kid. Fuck up. I'm going right back out there. I'm going to I'm going to shoot out some more emails and submissions this week. Don't worry. Right. We'll find a home. 
And it's and I will tell you, hearing it from you, Dawn, and I'm sure everyone yeah. hearing it now, if you've been through the process or thinking about the process, I have been through it and going through it and hearing the rejections and being like, I don't understand. What does this mean? Do they not like it? They don't like me. They're like, what I'm doing? What can I do? And as you mm-hmm. said, you just have to think about this is a business and it doesn't work for whatever reason. Their model, yeah. what they've seen work, timing. They might already have other books like this. You just never know completely. Right, right. You know, there's so many reasons that have really nothing exactly to do with you. It's just, it's just not the right fit. So you keep, they keep going out there. Right. And then here's the thing. Even when it comes to before that you even get to the point where an editor likes it and your agent comes back and says, oh, you know, Penguin Random House, this particular imprint passed. And it's like, oh, really? Why they, why they passed? Well, here's the thing. It might have went to an editor who I genuinely believed would buy a book like this. But guess what? Her last four books have tanked. And now she's skating on thin ice. Mm-hmm. And while she likes this idea, it's not a big enough book that it will outdo the, the, the poor performance of the last four books. So she's skating on thin ice and now she has to acquire really carefully. So she might come back and say, oh my God, Dawn, you know, if this was two years ago, I would eat this book up. But I have, you know, the books I've chosen haven't done that well. And now I've really got to get something that's going to like really kill it and live on the New York Times bestsellers list for a year. So this, while I love it, and years ago, I definitely would have wanted to put an offer in on this book. I'm, I'm on thin ice right now, and so I, I need something really, really big. So I'm going to pass because this just isn't big enough to undo what I've been experiencing, the struggles over the last couple of years. So again, nothing about the author, your writing, your story, your talent, your platform, nothing about you personally at all. She just hasn't been picking books that have performed well, and now she has to be extremely cautious in the next book that she makes a deal with. So again, mm-hmm. nothing to do with you at all. Right. But these are the, this is the kind of feedback that happens. And again, you know, it can be frustrating to the agent as well because most agents work in situations where they only get financial compensation when a deal is done. So as your agent, I'm working with you for months and sometimes years without any financial compensation. So trust me, I feel the frustration way before right. I have to deliver it to you. You but feel the never, pain too. Yeah, but it's never personal. It's mm-hmm. never personal. So I just want authors to, you know, push through and keep fighting, but know that it's not personal. If you believe that you should have a book deal, you'll get a book deal. That's you right. just have to be, you just have to be patient and resilient in the process. Mm-hmm. This is the yeah. kind of things we as writers will never know because we don't have a seat at the table. So I'm so glad you're filling us in on this. Now I want to find out from you, what do we need to do before we get the deal? So we sort of went through some of these things. I guess it's more reiterating some of the points. Mm -hmm. Your community is a point of your negotiation. So you talked about that having social media, but also talk about, like we said, those authentic connections and how you use that as a negotiating strategy. Yeah. So if most people, um, especially in the nonfiction space, whatever they're writing, they're already like doing interviews and they may have started like Facebook groups and and have a newsletter and database and things of that nature. So you really want to work on building that platform. Like I have an author that I'm working with now um, and his book is called Beyond Broadway Joe. And it's about the New York Jets winning Super Bowl three. Now he has, most sports writers don't, if they write a book, they, unless they're writing it with the talent, they're writing about a talent that did not sit down and get interviewed for the book. So the Allen Iverson project that I worked on, Allen Iverson was not interviewed for that book. We wanted to interview him. We tried to interview him, um, but his management uh, d- declined. They, mm-hmm. they wanted some, some money. So a lot of times you see these books on celebrities, but the celebrity is not necessarily involved in the book. But in my client Bob's case with the Jets book, He was able to get in contact with 36 or 39 members of the Super Bowl three New York Jets team Wow! and reach out to them directly through snail mail because these men are all over the age of 65. So they're not on Instagram. (laughs) (laughs) There's no DMs for them. No, there's no DM in them. Um, (laughs) Not no instant messenger. None of that. Um, (laughs) So he reached out to those players, their wives, their children, their grandchildren 
And they all agreed to talk to Bob and help promote the book in, in some type of way. So Bob, as an author, what made me want to sign him? He didn't have the sports writer platform like Kent Babb for the Washington Post. But he came to the table with relationships with 36 members and then general manager, uh, the team's photographer from back in the day, um, a Jets paraphernalia collector. He came to the table and said, nope. I'm just a super fan. I don't write for any particular sports publication, but I have access to the men who actually played on the field and the management that was around them, the photographers and people who are hardcore fans that have collected paraphernalia. That's my circle of influence. I'm coming to the table with these relationships. And then those relationships led him to getting relationships with the current Jets organization. So when it comes to saying, what can you bring to the table? Most sports writers can't come to the table and say, oh, I'm doing a book on a New England Patriots and Tom Brady and Bill Belichick are on board with me. Mm -hmm. Most people can't say that. This author could say that. So that is a point of negotiation and and push to get the book deal done. Um, And and I was able to get him a deal, you know, and, and a pretty good deal simply because he came to the table with relationships and I was able to say to the editor, you and I both know that sports books come out all the time and the teams have nothing to do with these books. He actually has the players and two of the players did the forward for his book and are going to be like promotional partners. So when the book comes out, we'll tour, but there will actually be players from that team present Touring. in the room. And right. that's what's going to be real, you know, and that's what's going to be huge. really cool. Yeah. So the author for, you know, the Allen Iverson book, I had another client did a book on the Seattle Seahawks, but the players aren't in the room with, with the authors. Mm-hmm. In this case, they will be because those are relationships. So again, you want to look at, as an author, whatever your book is about, the relationships that you have with who can help you with your book, because that, those, again, are points of, of negotiation on, I need to go to these six cities because as a relationship blogger, I've made relationships in these six cities with like the largest relationship experts, people who are on the Tom join a morning show that cover a relationship segment. Um, you know, local television shows that have a relationship segment. I need to go to these six cities because I have networks there and everybody's on board to push this. That would be a reason where you could go back and say to your, to your editor and even, even to the agent, listen, I really need you guys to help finance financially get me to these six cities because we have really large networks here, like, and we're going to pull out big gatherings and, and all the bells and whistles. I just need you guys to get me there. Mm-hmm. But if you don't have that, because every author wants to go on a tour. Here's the thing. That's what your advance is for. Your advance mm-hmm. is so that you can get you some Delta tickets, some yep. JetBlue, some JetBlue miles, some right. American airline points. That's what the advance is for to help you. One is to compensate you for your work if you have to do any additional research, if you need to fly somewhere to interview someone. But it's also, as an agent, I tell people, you know, put some of that to the side for the promotional part. So if you want to do an event in Houston, but you live in New York, there's no reason, and you're not from Houston, there's no incentive for the publisher to pay to send you to Houston just because you want to go there. But if there's an organization that you have agreed to partner with, and, and they want you to come and they're going to rent out a school auditorium and you're going to do this whole big talk back and the local, local politician is, is going to host the event for you, then that's a reason that you can say, listen, you guys, it's going to be like over a thousand people waiting for me in Houston. You, you guys got to get me there. If not, you can go to Houston, but you just got to go to Houston on your own dime. That is so so important for people to hear about the events. And I've heard uh, other authors say that too, just they saved part of it for the promotion because they knew yeah. that, you know, the publisher is going to do so much, but you want to hire your own publicist. And as you said, be able to fly yourself wherever you need to go. You don't want to not be able to go for that kind of reason. So again, for everyone thinking about the deal, even when you get the deal, think about not just blowing that money. Yeah, you treat yourself to a little something, mm-hmm. but not just blowing that money, right? Like you said, put some aside and be able to use that for promotion of the book because a lot of it's going to be on the author right the author and their team their personal team. yes yes because here's the thing you know when galleys come out so galleys are basically an advanced read copy of of the book those will come out anywhere between 
four on the, sh the low end and six months on the high end before the actual publication date. So the publisher is going to do their own galley mailing. They're gonna send some to you, the author, some to the agent, if the agent has relationships, to basically get advanced reviews and endorsements for the book and any type of media that they can get, like long lead publications um, and things of that nature. But now as it gets closer to the book, you know, once it's within a six week time frame of, of your book coming out, you may have the publishers all hands on deck type of support for six to 10 weeks. After that, again, this is a business. There's already 10 other books coming right behind yours. Mm -hmm. So if your book is coming out on September 15th, guess what? But they already have another book coming out on September 22nd. September 30th, they got another one coming out on October 1st. So, so they got it. Unfortunately, they got to keep it moving because the same publicist is probably working on six books, 10 books, 12 books at one time. All the books are just in different phases of the campaign. So that's why they say, you know, you should look into hiring your own publicist if you want to take this show on the road because you need someone who can hang out with you for the next four to six months and keep pushing your message and keep pushing you. The publisher can only do it for a season because they have so many more books to continue that same process with. Now, for anyone who's thinking about bringing in um, a publicist or someone to work with them on their book, mm -hmm. say they've gotten the deal, they've written the, the book, and it's about to come out w at whatever point, how mm -hmm. far in advance do you usually begin working with clients in order to get the, the ideas rolling for what kind of things they are going to do to promote the book? How far before well, release, I should say? Well, here's the thing. Depending on um, the resources of the author and what the publisher has agreed to do, I personally prefer... Uh, six months like so if the publisher is not really pushing or doesn't have the relationships to push long leads let's say you want to you know you want to do your essence ebony's and l magazines of the world um if they're not pushing those but you as an author really want them um then you need to have a publicist on board at that time so that they can push those out there because you can't hire a publicist three months out and say i want to be in the summer issue of, of essence that issue closed months ago. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a project. Um, I was working with Tia Williams on the perfect vine mm -hmm. and her book came out in the summer. Yeah. Her book came out in this. No, I think her book came out. Yeah. In the summer. And we um, were pitching essence and ebony in January, January. Right. And Six months lead time. Mm -hmm. No, you know, in fact, I think her book came out, like April, May, but I started working with her in January. So what mm -hmm. happened, we pushed and pushed and pushed. Obviously the April issue, you know, we're like three and a half months out. That's cutting it really close unless they had a little space where they could say, oh, you know, we could dedicate a little five question Q&A or we could drop her book in with this list of spring reads or something like that. But what, what they did do was from January pitching, she was in Ebony, she was in Essence, um, she was in Black Hair Magazine, but the summer issues, the June issue, the June or July issue of those three publications from the pitches that we did in January. Mm -hmm. So she didn't make April, which is when the book came out. But again, so the lead time, you know, we had the relationships and, and were able to, um, you know, to get her book in, in those publications, but we didn't start early enough to get it in for April. So starting in January produced June and July placements. So again, depending on the relationships, now if the author has those relationships and she or he can get that done on their own by sending out the galleys, then you don't necessarily need to have a publicist um, that far out. You, you know, you could wait till you get a little closer. But also the other thing is if you want to be visible. So there's book events where you're doing something at Barnes and Nobles or something at a local YMCA or a beauty shop or something like that. But then there are events of, Oh, I want to be a speaker at Essence or, you know, I want to be on the stage at Blavity's 21 uh, conference, 21 mm -hmm. summit. If you want to do something like that, most publishers honestly don't have those type of relationships. And that would be a reason why you will want to bring in a publicist early as well. So that when these organizations are planning their conferences, Elaine could be considered as one of the featured speakers. Now, 30, 60 days out from the conference, you know, and that's when your book comes out, they may already be booked up. Right. And again, most publishers, because they're in the business of promoting the book and not necessarily, the book comes first, the author comes second. Mm -hmm. So publishers, 
if your picture is never seen in the magazine, but your book cover is, that's a win for them. My approach as a publicist is I, I want your face and the book. Um, and if I honestly can only choose one, then I choose your face because the commentary in the feature will give the title of your book. But for me, I like to push the author, especially if I know that you want to do another book. The book cover will change. Your face won't. <laughs> so right. if, people, right. if people follow you and your brand, then they're going to know about book one, book two, because that's what happened with Miyasha. You know, mm -hmm. it was it was pushing her. Yeah, the book cover has got featured, but that's what Simon and Schuster did. You know, that was their job. They're going to push the books. I pushed her as as a person, as a personality, and people brought into her lifestyle, her look, and what she was doing, and then her books just basically translated. You know. In, into a readership that just loved her overall. But it was always about her because she was doing multiple books. Right, and Elle was interested in her, not just her Yeah, book. It, right. they, they were interested in her story. And it's like, oh my God, who's the author of all these books? And then when they saw her, most people always thought she was a model or, or a singer because she was so pretty. Um, and they was like, wow, she's really pretty for an author. Okay, mm -hmm. go figure. Um, but it was, it was really about her and her story. And her story just happened to include the fact that she got this book deal with Simon & Schuster. Mm -hmm. You know, so again, you, you choose when you want to hire a publicist, but think about how much you can accomplish on your own and think about where the publisher is going to fall short. And then you know that you're hiring a publicist to help fill in the gap. Right. Yeah. Now, Dawn, whoo, my head hurts. So much. <laughs> I'm so glad this is recorded. But I know listen, we just scratched the like, surface. Take notes, I take, take notes, people. Listen, take notes, yeah. for everybody listening, I tried to tell you, get your notebooks ready. Make sure you go back and listen to this episode again. But as I said, I believe we just scratched the surface. I mean, I still have some bullets here that I want to go through, but I'm going to be conscious of your time and let people know that you are working on a book publishing course, which I know everybody's yes, happy to hear about. Yeah, so yeah, tell people, yeah. is there a place that we can go to sign up for when that's ready? Because I know you have tons of more, tons more, I should say, uh, great yeah. information to share. Where can we go to so, find out more? So to, to find out more about the courses, you can go to dreamrelationspr.com. So that's dreamrelationspr.com and just uh, subscribe to the newsletter. Um, in fact, the newsletter is actually going to go out um, on Friday and it includes my first webinar on helping people to come up with an idea. So I'm basically an idea generator and this webinar is going to be on choosing the best book for your brand. But again, to join the mailing list, you can go to dreamrelationspr.com. And if you're interested in the webinar, you can go to the literary lobbyist series dot eventbrite dot com. The literary lobbyist series dot eventbrite dot com. And that's basically, that's for people who have an idea, but they keep getting rejections. They don't have an idea, but they really want to write a book. They're self-published and they want to now do something traditional. Because a lot of times you could be self-published and have success. And then when you try to say, okay, you know what, now I think I want an agent and I want to go the traditional way. Um, your writing doesn't quite give enough that a publisher wants to invest. So a lot of times self-publishers have um, a hard time transitioning over because they're like, well, wow, I, I did so good, you know, out of the trunk of my car. Like, why can't I get a deal? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's because you're mostly your promotions are to people who don't know the business. But now to get a deal, you're dealing with people who know the business. And a lot of times you fall short. So the webinar will cover that as well. But it's really to help people come up with ideas and then learn how to pitch or put their books out either way that they want to go. So the email. But it's going to be a really, yeah. So the email about the, uh, so people can sign up for your email list. Everyone, I will, of course, make sure I have a link to all this. Sign up mm -hmm. for your email list at dreamrelationspr.com. Yes. And, and uh, you're sending an email out about the webinar that's coming up. Is the webinar airing on Friday, uh, so the, July the 13th, web, or is it airing later? It's, it's no, the, the webinar is going to be um, July 28th at 12 okay. noon. Yeah. Okay, July 28th is the webinar. So everyone, I'm mm -hmm. going to link to the webinar and we're going to link to the page so that you can sign up and don't miss it. But for anyone who's listening to this after July 28th, you'll still be able to sign up for Dawn's email list. This way yes. you can know about future things that she has coming up if there's a webinar replay and all that stuff. Because I know, I know Absolutely. people are going to want to know more from you. 
Thank you so much. Yeah, like it, it's, it's so, it's such a big business. And I realize, um, you know, I've been going to writing conferences now for like the last seven, seven years, mm -hmm. but la between last year and, and the, the top of this year, really sitting down and talking to writers and usually conferences have these pitch sessions where people can come and give a quick pitch of their, of their book idea. And you could tell them what works, what's not working. And a few people would come back three times. So, you know, if there was an empty slot, they'd be like, oh, you know, if there's an empty slot, you could just go and sit in her chair again. And I had three people who came to me three different times. I was like, didn't you pitch me already? Yeah, but you were given so much information. I just want to come back and talk to you some more. Mm -hmm. So it made me realize, I'm like, you know what? I'm talking to people for five minutes and they literally will come back every 20 minutes for another five minutes just to talk with me. And I'm like, I have to get this information out. And I finally realized it's something about my transparency and the examples that I give. I really want people to have an understanding. Like once you have an understanding, then you can pretty much maneuver and, and craft something that will get you what you want because you have an understanding of how it works and you take your emotions out of it and then you become a strategic thinker. And that's really what I want authors to be is whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction, become a strategic thinker. And the more you know about the business of publishing, then you can really secure a spot for where you belong in it. That's right. Excellent. I think that's the perfect way to sum up this episode. Dawn, thank you so Bye. much. I appreciate you. I have a feeling I might be having you back. It's just so I just have so many more questions. But I know. I, mean, <laughs> I, to I, to I totally don't mind. You know, we could come up with very niche topics. If you want to do a whole thing on, on memoirs or just on the, the craft of building that platform, because again, people hear that platform platform all the time, but it's like, okay, like, it's not just your Facebook page and there are ways to get that done and platform building is ongoing. Right. You know? So there's, there's tons of topics that we can talk about, you know, Yay, we'll have to have Dawn yeah. come back. That's excellent. I love it. Dawn, I appreciate you so much. This was so wonderful. I'm, I'm just so happy that we connected and had our, our own conversation. You were so helpful to me. And now having this and being able to share this with the supportive, sexy audience, I know people are going to appreciate it. So everyone, again, I will make sure that I have links to everything that Dawn is up to so you can get in touch with her, find out more about her courses and all the things she has coming up. Make sure you visit her website, dreamrelationspr.com. Um, find out more yes, about and, her. and follow me on Instagram at and the literary lobbyist and follow her at the literary I love that the literary mm -hmm. lobbyist uh, follow thank her you. at the literary lobbyist Dawn thank you so much hold on for just a second okay all right. I hope you enjoyed that conversation, that masterclass, really, with Dawn Michelle Hardy. Did I lie? Do I tell any lies? I do not lie, right? Tons of great information, even if you're not into writing and publishing. I think it's just interesting to hear the real ins and outs of industries. I'm going to start doing more episodes like that, but hopefully you enjoyed this as much as I did. Now, to find out more about Dawn, to find out all the resources that she mentioned in this episode, tons of great authors, tons of great content, tons of articles and things that I'm going to make sure we link to, just go to supportissexypodcast.com, go to that search icon at the top and type in Dawn, D-A-W-N. Her show notes page will pop up. With those links, the resources, the way to get in touch with her, the way to find out more about her course, all that good stuff will be in there. Support is sexy podcast.com and just search Dawn. Now, if you are a woman entrepreneur who's looking for a way to share more about your business and what you're up to, I want you to think about podcast guesting, especially if you're thinking about writing a book or your book is coming out or you're on the way to promoting your book and want to tell more people about it. You got to consider podcast guesting. So to find out how to be an unforgettable podcast guest, just go to girlonpodcastgift.com. That's girlonpodcastgift.com. Learn how to be an unforgettable podcast guest, tell the world about your book, share your story, and get invited back again and again. All right. So thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you. Thank you for listening. Please, please let me know, me and Dawn, know what you think about this episode. I am at Elaine Fluker and at Support is Sexy on social media. Dawn is at The Literary Lobbyist. If you're listening, please screenshot it, share it on Instagram and Instagram stories. Make sure you tag us. Just let us know what you think and let Dawn know if you have additional questions. As you see, she's generous and a wealth of information. All right, now until we chat again next time, 
One thing I want you to remember is that support is sexy and having it all doesn't mean doing it all alone. And I'll chat with you soon. Take care.